the demo now. Yes, for my presentation. And also now welcome Harun to present his a very fundamental ideas about information and energy. I think this is something that we have been discussing as our, uh, uh, let's say, joint interest. And then I decide and ask to Harun if he could present some of those ideas in this uh, 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 workshop today. And then let's see what Harun has to say for us and then how you can learn about those fundamental relations between information and energy. So what is yours, Harun? Thank you very much, Pedro. Thank you very much. I hope everyone can hear me and that you can see my slides. So, yeah, uh, I went so fundamental that this uh, uh, this keynote is going to have one formula. It's sort of like a um, communications magazine uh, paper with uh, the permission of the editor. I have one formula. And um, we're going to talk about the relationship between information and energy, what, uh, what we found out in the 20th and the 21st century based on some ideas that uh, were out there in the 19th. But uh, there is a bit more to it. So rather than just doing the maths and physics of it, we'll also address uh, the, um, some, some effects of uh, information and energy relations on the, uh, on the community, on the society, and uh, how it influences the way we look at things, the way we value things, and um, yeah, how, how discourse around information and energy is formed. And uh, without further ado, I think I can go to the next slide. And uh, I start with uh, intent with uh, the Irish uh, exhibit uh, at the, uh, the Venetian, at the Venice Biennale uh, last year, uh, which uh, essentially represented a um, campfire. So this shape here you see in the in the image is a campfire. Uh, of course, it's built out of um, metal uh, components, and uh, it uh, corresponds somewhat to a data center. Uh, and uh, so you have a combination of a data center, campfire, and uh, these screens that show thermal imagery of uh, power consumption of uh, data centers. Um, and uh, other communication infrastructure. As such, uh, the, the authors of uh, this um, exhibit in the Irish Pavilion uh, have uh, demonstrated the, the link between uh, energy in their, in their particular uh, interpretation of energy being heat, uh, communication infrastructure, computation infrastructure, and, uh, and the society. And, um, when I, um, when Pedro uh, reached out to me to uh, give this keynote a um, few days after that, I, uh, I visited uh, a book launch from uh, the uh, authors of this collective. And um, then I realized um, there is much more to say than just um, the story of uh, Maxwell's demon, uh, Landauer's uh, limit, etc. So this is what I have, and we do start with. Maxions about the clumsily called equivalence between energy and uh, information uh, goes. So for the un uninitiated, Maxwell's demon is as a concept introduced by uh, James Clark Maxwell in a letter to a colleague some 170 odd years ago, uh, in which he poses this um, thought experiment in which there is a container with uh, gas particles, which has a separation in the middle. Uh, and uh, an intelligent being, a demon that uh, drives the door uh, based on the uh, observation of molecules of gas passing around. So, 
So if the demon sees a, a, a fast molecule, so a molecule moving quickly, uh, then uh, the molecule will be passed into the B compartment, uh, the right one in um, the figure you see in the slide. And uh, if, this, if the demon sees a slow particle, a slow molecule, uh, that uh, particle is to be placed into the left compartment, compartment A. And by operating uh, this trap door, Demon uh, sorts the molecules into a cold compartment, the one with slow molecules, and a warm compartment, the one with the fast molecules. And uh, this pretty much means that uh, you now, after the demon is done with, uh, with this um, action, you end up with um, uh, two separate uh, two separate heat reservoirs, which pretty much means that you have created uh, some potential for for work. So you have uh, gone against the second law of thermodynamics, which uh, which says that you wouldn't observe um, grouping of um, cold molecules and um, okay, not cold, slow molecules and uh, the fast molecules. Uh, spontaneously in a room, but rather you would uh, you would observe something of a mix, something of an equilibrium, the same the same way you had it in the original state. So the demon has uh, beaten allegedly the second law of thermodynamics, created some energy from it uh, that could be used. So now all of a sudden you have this thermodynamic motor that you can use. And uh, the question was, okay, how did this happen? And uh, how does uh, the second law of thermodynamics survive this uh, thought experiment? And uh, the explanations that came for the Maxwell's demon um, in the last 160 years were diverse. And um, the, uh, it was the so-called um, exorcism of, of the demon, uh, sometimes referred by the historians of science as such. Uh, that has taken many different shapes and uh, people would always come up with, uh, okay, but you haven't taken into account uh, this or that component and uh, the demon would just keep living on and uh, new theories were developed. So the whole idea of calling it, uh, calling it Maxwell's intelligent demon actually came from Thompson, and um, it uh, was the concept of having this intelligent, very powerful being that acts somehow in, um, in this scientific um, environment, which is not far off from uh, what we sometimes um, see in, um, in telecommunications when people mention geniated this and that. It's just that the genie sounds uh, much friendlier than a demon, I suppose. Uh, but uh, what about the, the whole uh, story around Maxwell's demon? And uh, why has it been so, so interesting for both people who, who have been initiated into the physics of it and those who have just heard of it in a, in a physics class and ever since I uh, thought, well, you know what, this is interesting. There are demons in physics in, the, in this um, field that I don't understand very well. There are these um, fantastic beasts. And uh, I will unpack that slightly here. Uh, I, would love to, uh, I would love to do more, but uh, we are somewhat constrained. Uh, in, in her book, Chaos Bound, and in other books in which she addresses the materiality of information, Catherine Hales uh, has a chapter on the Maxwell's demon, where she studies the relationship of the demon with uh, the scientists and engineers of the 20th century. And you may remember, it was uh, Paul Shannon that uh, established the whole theory, mathematical theory of communication slash information theory in the um, 
aftermath of World War II. And um, when he introduced entropy as an information concept, something that will immensely help later on to establish uh, information as a physical quantity uh, when, uh, when Landauer came in, uh, the reaction of uh, the historians of science like Jeffrey Wickham uh, came with, um, yeah, the reaction was uh, pretty harsh in which uh, the idea of using the same word, of using the word entropy for, um, for a concept that comes from information and uh, not from energy perspective, not from thermodynamics all of a sudden, uh, was the loose language that served the dark god of, of obfuscation. Uh, and that's funny because um, in, uh, in, the, in that passage, Wickham says, we don't give same name to different objects in science. And uh, from what I remember, it was David Hilbert or someone who said that uh, that's exactly the point of mathematics to, uh, to call uh, different things by the same name. And um, while opposed to poetry being uh, the art of giving different names to the same thing. And uh, it's amazing how introducing entropy as uh, as a concept in information theory at that point uh, has uh, later proven to be just the right match when, uh, when Landauer and after him Bennett introduced the, uh, the whole trade-off between the thermodynamic entropy and information entropy. And uh, while at the topic of uh, Hales's uh, treatment of um, Maxwell's demon, she puts uh, in an important uh, distinction between how Brillouin, one of uh, the physicists that uh, were early demon, uh, demon exorcists uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, Maxwell's theory, and uh, Shannon, both considered entropy, but they considered it with different signs. So uh, where where uh, Shannon thinks, you know what, and mm, more, more uh, uncertainty you have, more information can, uh, can, uh, can arise from it, the surprise and everything. That's where Berlin was uh, the complete opposite. And he would take that um, negative sign and that sum to be the positive sign and say, that makes uh, little physical sense. And, uh, uh, those uh, those quantities should be opposed. The information should be should be something else, and uh, the exact opposite. And uh, it's interesting that uh, with uh, such a perspective, uh, it was Brillouin's uh, approach to entropy and uh, the demon that uh, kept uh, being reinforced in physics textbooks, while it was Shannon's uh, approach that uh, got into engineering textbooks. That's something to think about next time you try to establish a common language and exchange information to stick to the uh, topic of this lecture, um, to exchange information with, uh, um, with the physicists. We speak uh, somewhat different languages sometimes. And uh, the symbolism of uh, Maxwell's demon doing this sorting uh, is strong in, uh, in the arts as well. And it shows that uh, people will pick up on a powerful metaphor from science, take it elsewhere, uh, might somewhat uh, lose the physical meaning of it and lose the, even lose the logic of it, but still maintain a strong, uh, a strong image. Uh, Denis Villeneuve is uh, popular these days because of the new, new Dune film. But uh, in 2009, he, he made a film called Polytechnique about uh, a misogynist uh, act of terror in, um, in Canada uh, where, uh, where a student, uh, wherever there were.
2018. And uh, the, the act of, uh, of Maxwell's demon. And once I get hold of Danny Villeneuve, I'll ask him uh, how, uh, how deliberate was all that. But uh, the, the idea that uh, you have uh, this agent, very powerful agent that uh, has uh, control over, uh, uh, over a heterogeneous system and uh, does some sort of sorting in which uh, entropy keeps on decreasing because uh, all of a sudden, uh, you know exactly what is in your left compartment and what is in your right compartment is powerful for, uh, for many political contexts and for the, for the social discourse. So it's, it's no wonder that it, uh, that it's propagated into, into arts there. But let us go back now once again to, to the physicists uh, who were trying to to investigate uh, what's going on with the demon. So in uh, 1912, from 1912 to 1914, uh, Smolokovsky published a couple of papers uh, related to Maxwell demon where he was studying a sort of a mechanical uh, setup uh, in which uh, uh, he was investigating whether, uh, whether the energy consumed by, um, by operating the door. So um, friction or uh, potential and kinetic energy of the, of the door might, uh, might be uh, compensating for, uh, for the gain of uh, this thermodynamic uh, energy and decrease of entropy that occurs uh, for the demon. And uh, there he puts to rest this, uh, rather realistic, clunky uh, apparatus of the time and says, yeah, this won't work. But, so as far as we know today, he says, there is no automatic permanently effective perpetual motion machine in spite of the molecular fluctuation, but such, the, uh, such a device might perhaps function regularly if it were appropriately operated by intelligent beings. So, First off, intelligent beings. Here comes the, uh, Thompson also used that word for the demon, intelligent. So uh, this presumption that uh, the whole uh, observation, see what's fast and what's slow and open the door uh, accordingly is the result of um, this fuzzy intelligence concept rather than, uh, rather than some sense and feedback. Uh, which uh, which will come in much later uh, with um, with um, cybernetic go approach there and uh, so intelligent beings being uh, also suggesting something um, somewhat biological in nature uh, and uh, appropriately operated now so the term operation came back there uh, with Smolohovsky. It was, it was gone uh, for 50 years from the, from the discourse uh, around Maxwell's demon. When, when you speak of operating, it's uh, fundamentally linking uh, the, the whole procedure with, uh, with labor. So there will be this labor that is opening uh, and closing the door, the worker the intelligent being all of a sudden is uh, the worker. And uh, the, I found that funny because um, the illustration of Maxwell's demon, you see him opening and closing the door on, on your left uh, with Maxwell's portrait up there. That's something I'm, I made 10 years back uh, to illustrate um, a story of mine. And uh, I based it on uh, this portrait of uh, and this um, caricature of Engels sitting under the uh, portrait of Marx. And uh, it's not far off. Although famously, Marx didn't go much into uh, thermodynamics. And um, later on, um, there was uh, this whole ordeal, as some of you may know, about uh, some Marxists having issues with um, second law of thermodynamics. But 
there is labor in Maxwell's demon and in this course around it, because uh, the whole process of uh, let's get energy for free is the uh, is the idea of uh, supporting infinite growth as well. So I suppose there is a two and two to put together there. But uh, before that, let's uh, let's investigate a tiny example of um, of a simplified uh, demon which was called the uh, uh, Schillert motor after uh, another exorcist of the demon uh, back in the day, who pretty much uh, uh, went uh, with uh, the abstraction in which there is just one particle of gas. So in the whole, uh, there is there's a container with one particle of gas and uh, you are free to put, the, uh, to put this uh, contraption uh, with the um, with the weight and the barrier, which is essentially going to be a piston sort, uh, into the into the system the way you like. So you could put the weight on the left side or the right side, uh, and uh, whether you put it uh, on the left or the right depends on where do you think that the that the particle is, because if the particle is on the left. As the second uh, second figure uh, from the left shows, then uh, if you put the put the barrier and the weight into the system the way it's shown in the figure, then the expansion of the gas, uh, expansion of this virtual single particle, will push the uh, push the barrier towards the right and pull the weight up which will mean gain of potential energy and hence you will uh, you will be able to extract uh, to extract work there for your uh, for your contraption now for you to know where where the particle is you need to observe the particle and uh, in this case it's uh, it's pretty much like you're doing a uh, binary search or something and uh, uh, the particle is going to be in one of the two, and very simple binary search at that point. So the particle can be in, uh, in any of those two, po uh, two positions with the probability of uh, 50%. Uh, and uh, that pretty much gives you the maximum entropy and all that. And that's where that log two will later on appear in, um, in one hour's limit. So Wiener. The, um, uh, the originator of the term cybernetics and all uh, said once that uh, here there emerges a very interesting distinction between the physics of our grandfathers and that of the present day. In 19th century physics, it seemed to cost nothing to get information. Yes, so uh, when, uh, when the first study of the uh, of the Landauer limit came to uh, came to be uh, sorry of the of the Maxwell beam came to be in uh, uh, in the nineteenth century. It was yes, it's just observing. It's uh, it's nothing special. It's not equivalent to any physical process. Uh, and uh, that's uh, that's where the whole uh, lumping things into intelligent beings comes comes into play because uh, it was simply. Uh, uh, not considered as a contribution towards um, towards the energy budget, uh, and uh, only uh, only later on comes the uh, comes the story in the twentieth century of the energy cost of information. But for that, information had to be quantified, and um, that's where the information theory came. Now, uh, one could be tempted to to make a quip. An extension of, of this claim from Wiener and say that um, um, if the if in the twentieth century they realize that there is cost to information, uh, maybe in the twenty first we have reached the point where where information has become a currency uh, of its own. But um, I will refrain from that, uh, not to go off on a tangent. 
And here comes the first and the last formula of this presentation. I, uh, I once put it in line in text uh, in a communications magazine article. So I just put KT, Alan Thu, and um, um, the editor just said, you know what, you will have to start with it. It's against the rules to have even such a short product of three terms. And uh, yeah, so K standing for the Boltzmann constant, T standing for the thermodynamic temperature of the, of the environment, and log two standing well for log two. That is the uh, minimum uh, energy uh, that you have to pay the universe for deleting a bit of information, literally a bit. And uh, that's, uh, that's Landauer's limit, uh, which, uh, which gained uh, its importance with um, what Bennett was doing later where uh, Bennett uh, observing the, uh, the, land, uh, the Maxwell's demon says, intuitively the demon's record of past actions seems to be valuable or at worst, a useless commodity. So uh, it's just like in, um, in any feedback control of which, um, uh, of which Maxwell's demon is a great example of. You may benefit from, from knowing the history, or at worst, you don't benefit. But uh, the, the odds are in, uh, in, the intuitive, um, uh, in the intuitive take, you don't, uh, the knowing history won't, uh, won't hinder your, uh, uh, your um, control strategy. You may just decide not to use it. But for the demon, yesterday's newspaper, the result of previous measurements, says Bennett, takes up valuable space and the cost of clearing that space neutralizes the benefit the demon derived from the newspaper when it was fresh. So that's where Bennett uh, offers uh, an explanation for, uh, for Maxwell's demon saying, yeah, it's the forgetting. It's the actual act of forgetting what the, what the previous measurement was, uh, resetting the, uh, resetting the buffer in which, uh, the, uh, in which the demon keeps the results of uh, speed measurements for, uh, for, the, for the molecules that uh, results, in, uh, uh, results in this trade-off uh, between, between entropy. So uh, to, uh, to remove information is to dissipate, uh, to dissipate heat necessarily so. And uh, that dissipation of heat compensates for the gain in, um, in heat and decrease in, um, a decrease in thermodynamic entropy uh, achieved by, by the demon. And that's, that's a pretty nice theoretical result, I would say. We have um, a decent um, tool for exercising uh, the demon, and we have the ability to to understand some uh, intricate relationship between information and, uh, and uh, energy. So that uh, entropy, of, uh, entropy of one and entropy of the other are fundamentally same-ish. Um, but uh, for ages, for 60 years now, uh, we, we have been, uh, operating with losses, uh, with energy losses in computation and communication that were orders and orders of magnitude higher than uh, this tiny number of KT, LN2. Uh, K is um, what, 10 to the power of uh, minus 21 or, or the like. And uh, so that gives you the idea of just how, just how tiny the, uh, the thermodynamic debt to the universe uh, is when you delete a bit of information. And uh, the odds are you're wasting much more on parasitic capacitances or whatever else. And uh, so the whole idea of, okay, sure, let's make computation reversible and uh, hence maintain the quantity, uh, maintain all the information in it so that we never have to delete it and never have to dissipate uh, 
dissipate heat uh, to pay for this logical irreversibility of, of computation, it was pushed to the side. Uh, justifiably so, uh, one might say, because uh, we were pretty good at doing this irreversible computation and uh, uh, spending uh, a decent power budget to, to compute things. But uh, remember that feeling of the infinite growth and uh, every uh, Cisco report with the exponential curve of IoT devices uh, and anything else, and of course, Moore's law, uh, with all of which uh, were aiming for um, constant increases in density of, um, uh, of, the, of the chipsets, and uh, as mentioned in the previous uh, uh, in the previous talk, the uh, the availability of chips in two thousand and twenty one is uh, a sad, sad market story. So all of that being said, and us living in uh, the quantum computation era, in which uh, reversible computation, so using these gates logic gates that uh, unlike say an AND gate in which uh, when, you, when you see an output of a zero, you don't know whether the inputs of it were one and zero or two zeros or uh, the flip one to zero. Uh, but you rather have to use uh, reversible gates for, uh, in which the, out, uh, the inputs can be reconstructed from the outputs. That's, uh, that's how quantum computation has to operate at this point to, uh, to maintain, uh, to maintain the, uh, the circuitry operating uh, correctly. That brings us to another relationship between information and energy. It's the quantum speed limit. Uh, the origins of the quantum speed limit, so, pretty much talking about, okay, how, how much and how fast can a quantum computer compute? And a uh, quantum computer doesn't have to be a quantum computer. It could also be a black hole or the universe itself. Uh, so the origins of uh, that come from uh, a paper by uh, the future Nobel Prize in the time and his, uh, his professor Mandelstam. Uh, which was written uh, in the last year of World War II. And uh, it ties together energy and time in an inequality similar to that one of, uh, of Heisenberg. Uh, and uh, back then, we didn't think about uh, quantum computers, of course. Uh, but uh, when we reached the point where things became information, computers, operations, flops, uh, all of the terms uh, computer scientists like to measure uh, efficiency. And uh, we got to something called margolis leviton theorem in which uh, uh, it stated that uh, the processing rate cannot be higher than six times 10 to the power of 33 operations per second per joule of energy, uh, which uh, is a high number but it is a strict limit as well. And uh, that uh, pretty much tells you just how far we can go in, uh, in promising uh, things from uh, quantum computers or any computers for that, for that purpose. Uh, you, can, you can derive uh, classical limits from it as well. And uh, probably the, the, this bound would make uh, it a limit that, uh, a um, universe probably couldn't simulate, no, the universe definitely couldn't simulate itself. So uh, that eliminates another demon, Laplace's demon, which would be the sentient, omnipotent, uh, omni knowledgeable creature that uh, computes uh, the states of every particle in the universe just based on knowing its position and, uh, and velocity. So we're, we're killing demons here. Um, here with the promises and caveats, I just wanted to say uh, it's not a silver bullet, uh, the whole idea of reversible computation, and you know that already. Um, and uh, the 
story of, uh, for instance, a recent paper from uh, from um, David Wolpert um, and um, Artemi, uh, who, who led that research, pretty much, uh, Polchinski, uh, pretty much uh, gives the idea of, uh, yes, this is the theoretical limit, but here is what actually happens in, uh, uh, in physical systems and uh, where other limits exist as well. And uh, with that, and uh, with a look at the time, uh, I am done with, um, with the talk. Thank you very much. Excellent, Harun. Very good. And Demon is very scary. <laughs> but it's nice. So uh, I don't know if anyone has questions. Probably everyone has a lot of questions. And But I think this is a, a very important, very important topic, actually. So I think uh, Harun and myself are working some ideas. And I think there is uh, nice things to to discuss in, in things that like uh, is usually like for example this uh, 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 intelligent reflective surface of things like uh, well yeah you can benefit but you are decreasing the entropy so what's the cost and like energy goes somewhere and then I think those things are usually neglected even in, in theoretical models that should not and then uh, I think there are things that are uh, 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 important, and then if you say, okay, uh, if you think, okay, this is a, a very only theoretical game or so on, then you can see the electricity consumption or the heating dissipated by a big data center, and then you remember, okay, this is not uh, 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 just uh, some play of from, from some people from physics and so on. It's very material in this sense. So I think you need to really consider things that are have been neglected or at least not well considered in, in, in at least in communication society and, and people that work with data processing and so yeah I think this is very good. Also uh, one thing like uh during well when I was writing myself the book there is I learned that they had like actually in auto universe they had a have done a very nice experiment in uh, uh I think atom level to prove that the demon really dissipates energy, and this is something like a, 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 that's very interesting. And uh, 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 hopefully, you are going to have time and 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 will to do some real research on it and and like a going move forward with with this direction. So I think that maybe you can like you are at four. And I think you can uh, uh, close in the, the meeting for today. And uh, I'd like to, to uh, uh, thanks everybody for this, for, for joining us in the, in, the, in the workshop and here for organizing this. And of course, people that has worked in the project and uh, uh, we're going to be very glad if you, if you like it, you can contact us, Hirley or I, and you can discuss some research ideas. The presenters are also very, uh, I can tell on behalf of the presenters, they will be very glad to receive your emails and messages if you want to discuss further uh, ideas. And I think, uh, uh, I think that's it. And very likely next year we're going to have a similar event. I think, as I mentioned in the beginning, so Hirley and I have been organizing those workshops that have been very uh, interesting, a lot of ideas, different talks. The, the old ones are also recorded in the website. And yeah, so that's it. So I wish you uh, a, a nice end of the year and hopefully you can see each other face to face in 2022 or maybe in 2023, nobody knows. So thank you very much. I don't know if Hirley wants to say something else. Oh, no, I think you said everything, Pedro. Uh, just like to thank everybody and uh, wish everyone a restful and happy holiday. Okay, so, so we can close the meeting. So 
bye bye then have a nice weekend and have holidays everyone thanks on now thanks yes thanks harun thanks subhan for the nice talks see you then bye bye thank you very much uh, brother thanks Janice. bye thank you bye take care bye 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 bye